Open your Bibles to John chapter 4. John chapter 4. When I was uh, when I was in high school, I think it was my junior year, sophomore year, somewhere around there. Um, one of my teachers, I don't remember what class this was for, and I don't remember what the purpose of it was, but one of my teachers had everybody stand up. And what she would do is she would give us some kind of ethical dilemma, some kind of ethical question. And each side of the room re represented one side of that dilemma. And you in the moment had to choose which side you were going to. Yes, I agree with this, or no, I don't. And there was the option to stay in the middle, but she didn't encourage that. She said, make a decision. Um, one of those, one of those that she said was, it's better to live with someone before you marry them. It's better to live with somebody before you marry them. Yes, I agree with that. No, I don't agree with that. Um, I had just become a Christian at the time. I'd been a Christian maybe six months. Um, and so I knew where Christ, what Christians believed about that. So I went to the no side. No, it is not better to live with someone before you're married. Um, Everybody else in the class went to yes. I was the only one that went to no. Everybody else went. And then the teacher revealed the shocking truth that actually couples who live together before marriage are much more likely to divorce. Couples that live together before marriage are much more likely not to make it in the end. And everybody heard that and they're like, what? What? Because in their mind, it's, oh, I'm just test driving the car to make sure I'm going to like it, right? It made perfect sense to me, though. Um, if, if you're living together before you're married, then in your mind, you always have in the back of your mind, uh, well, if this doesn't work out, I can, just, I can just hit the door and leave. And nothing changes when you get married. That You still have that in the back of your mind. Understand, that was in 2008, that was in 2008. Today, the question would be, would there be one who would go to the no side? W would there be one who would go to the no side? When I was a kid, sexual sin was still kind of hush-hush. It was still hush-hush. I was at transition time 70 years ago. Sexual sin was condemned very loudly. In the 90s and 2000s, it was still seen as bad, but nobody really condemned it. Um, they just kind of said you should love those people and pray for them. Um, today, it is celebrated and promoted. It's celebrated and promoted. Today, it's very out in the open. There's no shame around it at all anymore. Um, everything from cohabitation, living together, to hookup culture, to homosexuality. There's not even shame around the use of pornography at, at that much anymore. Um, the non-Christian world just kind of expects that the average person looks at pornography regularly, and there's nothing wrong with that in their mind. Um, they're just blowing off steam after a hard day at work. Um, here's the deal. If I took a poll of everyone in here, you probably all have somebody in your family who is in one of, those in one of the following categories. They either live with someone they aren't married to. They have a child out of wedlock. They are known to use pornography. Or they are homosexual or transgender. And so my original plan as I'm preaching about marriage on Sunday morning, my original plan was on Sunday nights to preach about all those different types of sins. Um, but then it occurred to me, well, I, I got to know my audience, and um, none of my audience is being tempted to shack up with somebody. Um, and so m maybe shift that a little bit. Um, so many of you have loved ones that are in those sins. M many of you have loved ones who are living in those sins. So the question is, how do you love them? How do you love them when they are doing something that just doesn't jive with what you know the Bible says to be true? We're going to look at a familiar story um, that I actually preached recently since I preached through John. Um, but I want us to explore that story again, looking for a specific detail. How did Jesus love a person in sexual sin? So John 4, we'll start in verse 3. Jesus left Judea and departed again for Galilee, and he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, so Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. 
Jesus said to her, give me a drink, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that's saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw water with and the well is deep. Where are you going to get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us this well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The, son said to him, the, the woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Jesus said to her, go call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you're right in saying I have no husband. For you've had five husbands and the one you have now is not your husband. What you've said is true. The woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. What often happens, what we see um, when, when, when you have a loved one who's in some kind of sexual sin, what, what often happens is you go to one of two extremes. Either you completely push them out of your life and never talk to them again, or you become completely accepting of that sexual sin. We, we don't really know how to meet in the middle on that how to um, not push the person out of your life, but not accept their sin and love them in the, in the middle of that. Um, as with most anything, though, there's a middle ground between that, and Jesus shows us what it is with his interaction with the woman at the well. First thing I want you to notice about how Jesus interacts with those in sexual sin is that Jesus moves toward the sexually immoral. Verses 3 through 9, Jesus moves toward the sexual immoral. He doesn't run from them. He doesn't push them away. He comes to them. He doesn't avoid them. Notice it says in verse three, verse 4, he had to pass through Samaria. He had to. Why is that there? Well, he goes to Samaria. Most Jews would not have gone to Samaria. Um, it, my, it, it, they would go around Samaria. So um, if, if they're going from here to here, Samaria's in the middle. Um, they hate Samaria so much, they're going to make a loop around and go to that city below. You, they don't want to go to Samaria. Uh, my dad has never been down here since we've moved. Um, the big reason of that is he hates Atlanta traffic so much. Like, he does not want to drive through Atlanta traffic that bad that he hasn't even been here to visit us in two years. Um, like, so, so if he, when he does come down here one day, he's planning to, when he does come, like, I could see him passing through Alabama and coming around to get here, like making that long of a trip, because that's how much he hates Atlanta traffic. And that's how Jewish people were with Samaria. They don't want, not because of traffic, that they hate Samaria that much. We know that there were some racial issues between Jews and Samaritans. Samaria was a kind of a half-breed of Jewish people and, and pagan people, and so Jewish people didn't like them. Um, but Jesus went to Samaria. He did not go around it. He went through it. He went there knowing he was going to meet this woman at the well. We often completely avoid those in sexual sin. We do. We, we completely ignore them. We avoid them at all costs. Why do we do that? Are we scared they're going to rub off on us or something? How many, here, here's some questions for, for you and I to ask ourselves, because I'm not perfect on these questions either. How many homosexual people do you know and have any kind of a relationship with? How many couples living together have you ever had into your home for dinner? Many of, of these people think the church hates them because often the church just never associates with them. They don't think the church hates them because of some crazy preacher, just because, like, the church doesn't associate with them. 
There's a woman um, named Rosaria Butterfield. She's a, um, she was at one time a college professor who was a practicing lesbian. Um, she lived with her girlfriend at the time, and she met a pastor in her neighborhood. And that pastor um, invited her over to have dinner with him and his wife one night. And she came, and she, it, this actually turned into a weekly thing. She would come every week and have dinner with this pastor and his wife. And she went in with a plan. She was going to make this guy look like a fool. She had all these questions prepared. You know, she's a college professor, so she knows everything. She's an expert on every field out there. She comes in with all these questions. And that pastor just, I mean, he didn't come in, like, like you know, with a list of answers to give her. He just loved her. Like, him and his wife just had her in their home had dinner with her, talked with her, got to know her, loved, showed love to her, and, and befriended her. She was always met with love and grace, no matter how much she tried to push this guy's faith to the side. And she ended up giving her life to Jesus and being radically transformed because of that. Today, she writes Christian books and speaks at conferences about how to evangelize the LGBTQ community. Um, she's married to a pastor today. That doesn't always happen. Um, when, when, a, when, a, when a homosexual person turn, comes to Christ, they don't always lose their same-sex attraction. She did. Um, she did. Um, sometimes God doesn't change same-sex attracted people, and they have to just choose to remain single for the rest of their life to be obedient to Christ. Um, but, but she got to marry a pastor. She, she wrote a book about this whole story called The Secret Thoughts of an Unlikely Convert. Um, a very good book. Check it out. Um, but think about this woman here in, in Samaria. Why is she alone? She comes to the well, and she's by herself. It was not normal in, in, in this time. Women all went to the well together to draw water, and they went early in the morning. They didn't go at noon like she's doing. They went early in the morning before it got hot, and they did it as a social event, that they would all go together. So why is this woman alone? She's the town pariah. That's why she's alone. She's got a shady sexual life. What, what about those who aren't choosing sexual sin? Um, let, me, let me rephrase that. What about those who um, aren't choosing sexual sin currently, but they find themselves in the consequences of some sexual sin from their past? What about those people? An example that I would give you is a teenager that is pregnant. What about those that maybe they're maybe they've chosen to no longer walk in sexual sin, but now they have some kind of um, so, some kind of consequence of their sexual sin? What do we do with that? We move toward them. We don't cast them out. When, when I was in high school, I had just come to Christ. I was I was really trying to figure out my faith. I was really trying to get a grip around everything that I believed. And um, this teenager in my church turned up pregnant. And they were going to have a baby shower for her. And I'm like, what's wrong with you people? You're giving approval to the sin that she committed. What's wrong with you? Now, today, I would say, Aaron, what's wrong with you? Because that baby's conceived. There's nothing we can change about that. She's con the baby's conceived, so let's love the mother and let's love the baby. Let let's do that. Let's not throw her aside like trash. Let's love her. When nobody else in town would go to the well with this woman, Jesus chose to pass through Samaria and go straight to that well and sit down and wait for her. And she showed up, and he said, give me a drink of water. He moved toward her and immediately established a friendship with her. Jesus moves toward the sexual sinners. Secondly, verses 10 through 15, Jesus speaks of the satisfaction of God to sexual sinners. He tells them how satisfying God is. This woman, we find out, has had five husbands, and she's currently cohabitating with a man that isn't her husband. She's, um, sh that, that is that she got married to one guy, didn't work out, so she divorced him. She, she didn't want anything to do with him. She left. She married another guy. That didn't work out, so she went to the next guy and did this five times. And then she decided, well, maybe it's just marriage. Maybe that's the problem. So she just found a sixth guy, and now she's living with him. She's the town pariah because of that. But what does that tell you about her? She's trying to find satisfaction. She's looking for love in all the wrong places. She thinks a man is going to do that for her. She thinks a man is going to satisfy her, and she hasn't found it yet. She still hasn't found what she's looking for. I'm going to see how many song references I can make tonight. Understand this. Every sexual sinner is seeking satisfaction 
every sexual sinner is looking for, for satisfaction. The teenager who looks at pornography multiple times a day is trying to find satisfaction. Give me the buzz of it one more time, and it never lasts. The person who is hooking up with people every weekend for some kind of sexual gratification, they're seeking satisfaction, and they can't find it. The, the homosexual, the adulteress, the cohabitator, they're all seeking gratification. They're seeking the buzz that, that sexuality gives, and they think that's all there is. They think there's nothing else. There's no higher form of pleasure in all the world than that, and there is. There's something more satisfying, and Jesus points this woman to it. He tells the woman what it is. What's he tell her? He says, hey, give me a drink. And she says, you don't have a bucket. How am I supposed to give you a drink? And he says, look, if you knew the gift that God gives, you wouldn't even be, I wouldn't be asking you for a drink. You'd be asking me for a drink, and I'd give it to you. I'd give it to you. I'd give you living water. I would give you water that, verse 14, whoever drinks of it will never be thirsty again, but the water that I give them will become in them a spring that wells up to eternal life. I'd give you that water if you'd ask me for it. If you knew what God gives, you would be asking me for water, living water. But where are you going to get a bucket? He says, I don't need a bucket. I'm going to give you that water. I'm going to spring up inside of you with that water. Uh, it's going to be so satisfying. Let, let me ask you, is that how your faith is? Is that how your Christian life is? Because honestly, some sexual sinners are more satisfied with their sin than a lot of Christians are with Christ. You know, a teenager who looks at pornography all the time, an adulteress running around on her husband, those people are more satisfied than a lot of Christians I know with Christ. Like, sometimes it's like pulling teeth to get the average American Christian to come to church more than twice a month. And, and, and yet, the, this teenager that looks at pornography goes back to it every single day. Like, he's found something there that, that apparently the average American Christian can't find, for some reason, in Jesus. Is Jesus satisfying to you? Does he change you? Can you describe your walk with Christ like that? How will the sexual sinners in your life ever find Jesus satisfying if you don't? I can only say what the woman says, verse 15, Sir, give me that water. Give me that water so I won't have to be thirsty again, have to come here to draw water again. I've been coming to this well to get water every day of my life, and it hasn't satisfied me yet. You know, the teenager's been coming back to his computer every night trying to get his thirst quenched, and it hasn't worked yet. Every sexual sinner, every, non, every sin that isn't sexual, they're coming back to the well every single night trying to be satisfied, and it's not working because there's only one who truly quenches your thirst. There's only one who does it. Jesus moves toward the sexual sinner. He speaks of the satisfaction of God to the sexual sinner. And then verse 16 through 18, Jesus graciously confronts the sexual sin. He graciously confronts it. He doesn't condemn her, but he also doesn't affirm her. He doesn't condemn her for her sin. He doesn't affirm her sin, though. That's where our culture is. You either condemn sexual sin and you're seen as a bigot, something like Westboro Baptist Church, or you affirm and celebrate it and you're seen as loving. You get to pick one or the other, according to our culture. You see Christian organizations selling out to the LGBTQ agenda every single week because they're buying the lie that you can't love them without celebrating them, and that's not true. Jesus didn't celebrate this woman's sin. He confronted her. But then he asked her for a drink of water. He, he, he did something here that was um, the middle ground. Um, in the early days of the church in the first century, um, th there was the issue before them that if you, don't, um, if you don't pay homage to Caesar, you lose social capita. If you don't worship Caesar, if you don't sprinkle incense to the emperor, you're, you're not seen as popular in the, in the um, society, and you will have privileges taken away from you. Just understand, in our day and age, the LGBTQ agenda issue is going to be the worshiping Caesar. It's, it's going to be what, what we're going to get social capita or lose social capita on. If we don't celebrate them, we're going to lose popularity with the culture. Be prepared for that. Be prepared for it. So Jesus addresses her sin. He doesn't condemn her like you know, Westboro would. He doesn't celebrate her like Oprah would. No, he just addresses it as truth. He, we, we speak truth to, he speaks truth to her, but he does it graciously. That is what Jesus is. He's full of grace and truth. 
We never compromise truth for grace, and we never compromise grace for truth. We, we, we have them both. He speaks truth to her, but he does it graciously. We have to learn to speak the truth in love, not speak the truth in hate, and not refrain from speaking the truth because of love. Ephesians 4, 15, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ. Speaking the truth in love grows you in your faith. People won't come to faith if we don't speak the truth, if we, if we aren't honest with the, what the truth says. If someone is in sexual sin and I don't tell them that it's sin, they've got no reason to leave that sin and run to Jesus. They've got no reason. Regarding your loved ones in sexual sin, You've got to know when to address it. We've got to know when to address it with our loved ones. Um, there, there's two guidelines for that. Let me give those to you. First of all, don't address it every time you're with them. You know, every time you see the person, you're going to bring up their sexual sin. You know, you know, I, I just can't talk to you without bringing up the fact that you're a homosexual. Like, that's just going to fill every conversation with, that we have until you change. Well, you're not going to have many more conversations with them because they're going to run from you. Or... So don't address it every time you're with them, but address it sometimes. Address it sometimes. Don't just pretend like it's not there and never talk about it. And don't just address it once and never bring it up again and think, well, I addressed it once, so I, that's all I can do. you you got to know when to talk about it. Pray for them every single day. Pray for opportunities to lovingly discuss it and love them whether they respond to you positively or negatively. Jesus graciously confronts the sexual sin. Fourthly, verses 19 through 24, Jesus answers tough questions. He answers tough questions that the sexual sinner asks. Very often, sexual sinners have tough questions they will ask. Probably the most common one is, why would God think this is wrong? I love this person. Why does God think this is wrong? I'm, I love this person. I'm not hurting anybody. You've, you've got to know the answers to give them. So learn. Read and meditate on your Bible and know the answer. Know your Bible in and out. And then read good books about these issues. Uh, probably one of the best books I've read on the issue of, of loving sexual sinners is called Out of, the, out of a Far Country. It's by a guy named Christopher Ewan. Um, it, it is basically a, a biography of his life. Um, so Christopher Ewan was a, um, I think he was like 19 at the time. He came out to his parents as gay. Um, and he, um, his parents didn't receive him. They, they actually like were, were disgusted, and so he ran from them. They weren't Christians at the time. He ran from them. After he ran from them, they became Christians. So it was after they, after he, um, after they rejected him that they came to the right worldview that understands what homosexuality is. At that point, they were just kind of like, yeah, this doesn't fit into our worldview of what you should be, so we can't accept this. Um, so they became Christians. Both parents did. And the entire book is just jumping back and forth from mom to, to son and telling the story of how God brought Christopher home and how he came to Christ. And it led to, like, he, um, after he left the home, he ended up in drug addiction. He ended up drug dealing. Like, like it's just a terrible place that he ended up. After he was in prison for drug dealing, um, after he had multiple sexual transmitted diseases, God finally pulled him out of there and said, you're You're mine. You're mine. And the whole story is about how his, his mom just loved him the whole process, loved him all the way from when he ran away and she became a Christian until he finally came out of the far country to Jesus. It, it deals with the homosexual issue, but, but it could be applied to any sexual sin. How do you love those in sexual sin? Read their story and find out. Christopher Ewan, um, him and his mother are now, they now go around speaking about this issue. How do, you, how do you love those in your life that are in sexual sin? Multiple authors are writing in this area right now. I already mentioned Rosaria Butterfield. Um, there's Sam Alberry. There's Jackie Hill Perry. Um, a guy named Andrew Walker has written a terrific book called God and the Transgender Debate. Um, all of these are great resources for you to check because you need to know the, the answers to tough questions. You need to know how to answer these. You need to understand that because they're going to ask you hard questions. Jesus is asked here about worship. And honestly, she asked him this question to try and get him off track, it seems like. He's talking about her sexual sin, and she throws out a question about worship. Hey, tell me what you think about this issue of doctrine. And he answers it and comes right back to the issue. He does not get off track. 
so that he does the final thing for a sexual sinner. Verses 25 and 26. Jesus points people to the Messiah who is himself. Jesus points sexual sinners to the Messiah, to himself. People need that more than anything. They need that more than anything. What homosexuals need is not, what, what, what homosexuals need most is not to become heterosexual, but to become holy. They need to become holy. If the sexual sinner in your life stops living in sin, but never comes to Jesus, they're no better off. They're no better off. They need Jesus. They need the Messiah to save them. That They need the Messiah to come in and be their deliverer. Spend less time harping on their sin and more time sharing how incredible the Messiah is. Show him his, show them his glory, his love, his beauty, all the fascinating ways that he far surpasses anything you have ever imagined. They need to see him as beautiful and they need to come running to him. Because if they don't, it does not matter that they leave their sin behind. They're still on a path of destruction. They will still die in their sins. Even if they stop being gay or stop living with their girlfriend or, or whatever, they will end up in hell without the Messiah, without him. How does the woman respond? Remember, Jesus has done five things. He's moved toward the sexual sinner. He has um, spoke of how satisfying God is to her. He's graciously confronted her sin. He has um, answered tough questions, and he's pointed people to himself. So how does she respond when all this is done? Verses 27 to 30. Just then, his disciples came back. They marveled that he was talking with a woman, but no one said, what do you seek? Or why are you talking with her? So the woman left her water jar, went away into town, and said to the people, come see a man who told me all that I have ever did, all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? They went out of the town and were coming to him. How does the woman respond? Notice verse 28. The woman left her water jar. Remember how the story opened? Hey, give me a drink of water. Well, you don't have a bucket to put it in. How are you going to get water? Well, now she no longer has a bucket to put it in. Why? Because she found the water. She found the living water. She doesn't need the bucket, the jar anymore. She leaves it behind. She leaves behind the very purpose she came to that well, and she runs into the streets. She no longer needs the jar because she's found the living water. She's found true satisfaction. She runs into the streets. She can't stop talking about the Messiah that she's met. She, uh, I can imagine she went to all those six men in her life, all five that she had divorced and the guy she's living with, ran to each one of them and said, hey, hey, I finally found what I'm looking for, and it wasn't you, you fool. It's this guy over here. Come talk to him. Come talk to him. And they all come, and they come and see him. And look at verse um, 39, many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. God took the town pariah, he took the one who um, had been so engrossed in sexual sin that women wouldn't even come near her, and she becomes the greatest witness to Samaria that the city's ever had. She, she becomes this woman who's found incredible satisfaction in Christ, and she is bringing the entire town to come see him. She's transformed, and he's using her story to change the world. So think about that person that you know that is living in sexual sin, whatever it may be. This is your prayer for them. Pray that this would happen to them. Pray that you can labor for this to happen to them. Pray that Jesus would be so satisfying to them that their sin would not be needed anymore. And pray that they would come running to him and love them along the way to them getting there so that someday they'll finally be out of the far country. Let's pray. Lord, you satisfy my soul. I pray that I never stop being satisfied in you. I pray that every person here finds you to be truly satisfying, better than a drink of water on a hot day. 
Lord, you have quenched our thirst since we know you. Father, I pray in Jesus' name that you would never stop quenching our thirst. And I pray for those in our minds. I pray right now you'd put someone on our mind, Lord, someone that we know who is in sexual sin. May we think about them right now. Save them. Open up their eyes to how beautiful Jesus is, to how satisfying he is, and may they come running to him to find living water. They're trying to find water in so many places, Lord. May they come running to the true fount of living water. They will never be satisfied out there in the far country. Bring them home, Lord God. In Jesus' name, amen.